Hey there, welcome back to another review, this time of the 2015 film Love and Mercy. Now this is a film that was also, I mean, you see a different release dates for it. It premiered at a film festival, I think it was called TIFF, in 2014, but it didn't come out in theaters in the United States until 2015, and it didn't come out on DVD and Blu-ray until later. Now, I'm only doing a review of this because I caught this film on Amazon Prime uh, recently, and it was mainly because I was uh, spending some time with my mom, and she was just decided to put it on because she thought it looked interesting. And I, uh, I watched the rest of it with her, and I wanted to make a video about it, a short little review of it, uh, because it's an. I thought it would be an interesting film to discuss. You know, usually in this channel, I do a lot of. You know, I usually do a lot of horror and action and sci-fi reviews, and those are my favorite genres. But I don't mind talking about dramas every now and then, sometimes. And I thought this was a pretty interesting, intriguing uh, drama. It was uh, based on a true story about the uh, musician and band member of the Beach Boys, Brian Wilson. And it dealt with the past and sort of uh, the future of Brian Wilson in a certain point in time uh, in his life. And it was definitely an artsy film. It definitely had an art house sort of sensibility and an art house uh, tone and, and feel to it. And that kind of turned me off in some aspects. But I would say I liked the film okay. I thought it was alright. I didn't think it was as amazing as the critics thought it was, mainly because I thought it was just a tale of two halves. It's a film that had a really amazing, enthralling, just captivating uh, series of sequences. The flashback scenes with Paul Dano as young Brian Wilson were just were just spectacular. They were well shot. The director actually looked like he had more passion shooting those scenes, and they were a lot more interesting than the scenes that took place in the 80s with an older Brian Wilson played by John Cusack and it dealt with this sort of romance he's trying to build with Elizabeth Banks' character and there's this drama with Paul Giamatti who is uh, a kind of a confidant, uh, a friend who became his legal guardian who's abusing Brian Wilson and, and really not being the best uh, influence to him and every time the film would go away from the 60s the stuff going, uh, dealing with the Beach Boys, dealing with Brian Wilson while he's working on the album Pet Sounds and trying to work on the album Smile, uh, it just loses my interest. I don't find it as interesting. I don't find it as uh, captivating. And I honestly think the film should have just been just about Paul Dano and the Beach Boys and young Brian Wilson while he's working on these albums and experimenting and doing different things with his music and uh, dealing with the early with the early onset uh, kind of psychosis that he would ultimately would deal with for the rest of his life. It's not necessarily, not necessarily uh, it is some sort of schizophrenia I believe he was dealing with because he was hallucinating. Uh, he was also having he was having auditory hallucinations. So there was a lot of, and he was definitely acting very strange and very weird, uh, and to the point where people didn't want to work with him, and, and uh, eventually that's why the album Smile was pretty much shut down, is because uh, the, the rest of the Beach Boys were like, we can't work with you anymore, we gotta let you go. Uh, the album was kind of semi-finished recently. Like, an album came out that had used some of the sessions that uh, Brian Wilson was working on with the Beach Boys, but, yeah, it's not necessary. it's not really official, it's kind of official, it's one of those kind of things where they had, they cobbled some stuff together and tried to get the most complete version of it they could, but it isn't necessarily really, truthfully, the album. Um... That stuff was very interesting. It was very cool to see uh, the film recreate the very unique sort of ways that Brian Wilson used uh, to create his music, to create a lot of the, the stuff that he was doing for Pet Sounds and for Smile. Um, this is the era of the Beach Boys when they were, they were competing with the Beatles. 
And uh, Brian Wilson actually was ahead of his time with the whole way of putting in messages underneath the music. And uh, a lot of his bandmates and uh, Mike Love, who was one of the guys who was who was a friend of the of, of the Beach Boys, who was also part of the band, technically. I don't think he did much singing on tracks. I think it was more like a consultant, a creative consultant type. And he was like, man, this isn't going to work. We need to go back to making our old music. This isn't stupid. This is stupid. No, why are you trying to put music words under the track? Nobody's going to care, man. You know, no one's going to hear it. And the other Beach Boys are like, hey, it's okay, you know, you know, yeah, people can't hear it, man, but it's cool, you know, it's, it's, it, it's something different. And that's really what uh, Brian Wilson was. He was ahead of his time. You can make an argument he definitely was a musical genius. And what's interesting about this film and about this character is a real life character, real life person, is that it's this, this tragic story of a young man who has stage fright, has a hard time being actually being in the Beach Boys, so he decides to take a job, he decides to, to go in the background, he decides to do more of just writing music and trying to create music, he has this music inside of him, he wants to let it out, and there's a lot of back, there's a lot of backlash from people, there's a lot of pushback, he, he wants his father to appreciate him, but his father doesn't give a shit. In fact, his father screws him over on the wretch of the Beach Boys uh, by literally selling their catalog for very cheap without their knowledge. Because his father's just a vindictive asshole. Because they fired him as their manager because he really wasn't doing that good of a job. But to him, you know, I'm their father, so I should be the manager. And so his reaction to all of the, him being fired is to be as vindictive and... Uh, just despicable as possible, and this is this is his father, and all he wanted is his father to appreciate him, you know, and his music and the stuff that he was trying to do, but his father didn't like it because it's different, and that's kind of the thing that yeah, Pet Sounds, you know, critics liked it, and it was just an album that was different from anything else the Beach Boys had done at that time, um, but it was ahead of its time because the Beatles would go on and do stuff like that and get sell albums and uh, get critical acclaim. I, I honestly do feel Brian Wilson, he didn't have this uh, mental breakdown where he just started to mentally go insane, pretty much. If he didn't have that happen, then I think the Beach Boys would be, I think they'd be well regarded and probably a lot, a lot more respected than they are by some people. Um, because a lot of people just remember them as just a surf rock band who didn't do much of anything. And it, it, it's watching this really opened your eyes and, and realize, you realize that they were ahead of their time, especially Brian Wilson, in so many different ways. And, and the ways that certain tracks were structured and the ways that, they, that he had certain harmonies and choruses and the background and things like that and sound effects. And yeah, it was very, very genius, brilliant a man and it's so tragic to see that the music that brought him so much joy is ultimately the cause of probably some of the most uh, stressful and, and uh, just hard to you know remember and think about parts of his career of his life because when he was doing all this experimental stuff that was when he was going starting to go a little bit insane not necessarily, you know, criminally insane, but, you know, mentally, you know, crazy. He was starting to go crazy. And, you know, he's dealing with schizophrenia. And uh, think about, think about it. You're in your 20s. You're a member of this uh, pretty popular Beach Boys band. You've uh, decided to get off stage because you're not comfortable there. And you're creating your music and you're having a good time and it's wonderful. But then the same thing that's allowing you to be able to create these this, these wonderful uh, compositions of music is also the same thing that's slowly starting to destroy your life and destroy your sanity. It's such a very tragic story of, you know, the ultimate pro and con. The pro of being able to be this musical genius, but your genius is is only there because of uh, uh, of upcoming schizophrenia. It's such a fascinating true life uh, tragic tale and that's why those sequences 
are so much more interesting and so much more engaging than the stuff with John Cusack and Elizabeth Banks and Paul Giamatti because that stuff is just kind of boring when you when you when when you get down to it they did a decent job recreating some of the 80s stuff but they could have done better because it didn't really feel like it just felt like they kind of did some clothes and some hairstyles like Paul Giamatti in a terrible looking wig but it just didn't really feel 80s it's like the director and the cinematographers, they did a great job giving the 60s flashbacks this 60s feel. They look like they come from the 60s. It looked like you uh, are watching uh, Time Warp. But here, you know, watching, you know, A Vision from a Time Warp. But in the 80s ones, it doesn't really feel like that. It just feels like they just, I don't know. It's And, and the direction by Bill Pohl had... It's got some, he does a really great job with the flashback stuff, which I really do like a lot. And it seems like his visual style and his visual flair is more suited for those type of scenes. But, and may, or maybe he just has a lot of passion for that stuff. But it seems like he has less passion for the 80s stuff. And any of the new sort of things he tries to do with the camera work are kind of just don't really work for me. And I don't know, just seem a little bit too try hard. A little bit too pretentious type of art house uh, cinematography and directing. Um, there are some good stuff. I mean, the 80s stuff. It's a good performance by John Cusack. I'll, I'll definitely say that. Elizabeth Banks does the best she can with what she has to work with, which isn't really much, but she's a fairly likable character who is uh, who plays Melinda Ledbetter, who is uh, go on to be Brian Wilson's second wife. Paul Giamatti's uh, his psychotherapist, Dr. Eugene Landy, and Giamatti does a great job, usual as usual, as playing an asshole. But that's he just is kind of a one-dimensional character to me. He was just an asshole. That was really it. He was a manipulative asshole, and that was really about it. There wasn't anything else to the character. Um, but that maybe that's how it is in real life. But yeah, those sequences just didn't do as much for me. I always felt whenever the film would. Go away from the 60s flashback scenes. I was just like, oh, go back to this romance I don't really care about. Drama with Paul Giamatti. And I'm just like, just, just go back to the 60s stuff. That's a lot more interesting to me. But there was some good stuff near the end in terms of cinematography directing by when it comes to the 80s stuff. But it's mixed in with flashbacks. It looks like this crazy acid trip that John Cusack is having. Where he's having this revelation of what his character should do. Uh, to make his life better and you know to to go back to to him and it's this crazy acid trip that has a combined stuff from the past and the present and there's a really trippy shot of the inside of his eardrum which is really really well done I love that shot so there's a lot of really good uh, shots in this film it definitely is well directed there are times when the experimental sort of techniques don't really jive well with me in certain scenes but there's other times where it just works really well. The sound editing is definitely a huge, huge pro for this film. Because the, the film does such an amazing job putting you in the shoes of young Brian Wilson when he's going through and experiencing these audio hallucinations. When he's experiencing, it's just it, the surround sound and everything, it's just, it works so well to put you into his situation, which is a very torturous and just... Uh, you can see why a lot of people are doing with the schizophrenia and having these auditory hallucinations are just going through life terrified and just uh, anxious and stressed out beyond all belief because the slightest noise of just knives clattering on, on uh, the plate will just multiply to thousands of knives that all you'll hear is just the knives and the forks clattering on the plate and that would drive anybody insane. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's really too bad, you know, to, to see someone so young to have to go through that. And this, that's something that happens a lot. There's a lot more instances of people who are young, people who are old, and people who just go in and just get schizophrenia. And it, it's just one of those very complex things that I think, I definitely think we should we should do a better job in terms of treating some of these things because ultimately what happened is uh, Brian Wilson when he grew up I need you know the John Cusack uh, character he was uh, taken advantage of uh, by his psychotherapist who misdiagnosed him on purpose and loaded him up with all these type of medications so he can take advantage of him so he can 
you know, get him to write, sign all these contract deals, get him to um, put do all this music so uh, for his own personal gain. So, I mean, yeah, it, it's uh, pretty tragic in, in, in a lot of respects. So, yeah, I ultimately I would say I thought the film was okay. It's just because I just didn't really get into the whole John Cusack stuff. Critics seem to love this. They love the unorthodox way of showing this biography stuff. And, and I just, I don't really care for that. I really don't because it just feels very disjointed. It, it doesn't really feel like, it doesn't really blend. It just feels kind of random to me. Uh, I, I think it could have flowed a lot better because of this just stop and start and stop and start sort of feel with this movie. It never really gets uh, a consistent flow. And it can get kind of, it's hard for me to get into it. And I don't know if it's a film I'd really watch again because of that. Uh, but I would have to definitely say I, there were things about it I definitely did like seeing. I'm glad I saw it. Uh, good direction by Bill Pohl had, um, Mute the score by Atticus Ross, which is just, it, it, it deserves all the praise that it gets because it's so great that you don't even think that it's a score that you think it's just music from the Beach Boys, but really what it is, he took different bits and pieces of Beach Boys, uh, uh, music and he made his own score out of it. And that is just amazing. It really is. It's great. And uh, the cinematography by Robert Ewerman is definitely not a Ewerman's job. Like, this is a guy who has a last name, which is Ewerman, which is kind of like, hey, this is somebody who just kind of does a meh, okay job. But, you know. And he did the same. I can't believe this is the same guy who did the cinematography for Ghostbusters, the Ghostbusters reboot. I can't believe that. Like, I cannot believe this is the same guy. Uh, th that is really stunning to me. He did it. He did just he did a phenomenal job of cinematography, setting up the shots, the way that he shot the flashback scenes. It looks like something straight out of the '60s. It's got a lot of color and life to it. And uh, I would say, though, yeah, those scenes were the best looking. But then when he went to the '80s, then it did kind of get kind of stock looking. But he did a good job of what he had to work with. Um, the film does, you know, it's 121 minutes. So it does kind of drag, and I think that some of the John Cusack sh stuff could have been cut, and it would have helped the pacing more, and um, <clears throat> it, it ends leaving you wanting more. It doesn't really have the best resolution. It, it'll have the whole stuff with the Paul Giamatti thing, uh, Elizabeth Banks gets enough evidence to convict to get him to basically relinquish his control over John Cusack, and John Cusack meets up Elizabeth Banks, and and what seems like a total, uh, you know, Hollywood cliche. She almost hits him with her car, and I, I doubt if that's what happened in real life. And they get back together, and they get they ultimately get married, but you don't really find that out on film. You see that after they meet up, and it's a kind of awkward ending that just kind of ends abruptly, and then you get like text crawl that says uh, Brian Wilson and uh, the character that was played by Elizabeth Banks Brian Wilson and Melinda they got married had five kids Paul Giamatti was you know convicted of something you know of doing what he did and you know he was it, it was just very it was just very kind of just oh matter of fact type stuff it was just oh here oh by the way this is what also happened and I'm like I, you, it just didn't feel like there was much closure, so there wasn't much cinematic closure there. It just felt like the, you kind of you only got the brief, uh, you know, the bare minimum of closure with this little text crawl at the end. But um, that being said, I I would say Love and Mercy is, is worth a watch. Uh, if if you know, definitely if you're interested and you enjoy the Beach Boys. And you like uh, musical biographies, you know, biographies based on, you know, musicians. But even if you don't, I recommend this solely for Paul Dano's performance, which is just, it is, it is a total standout. He steals the show. He totally runs away with this movie. And it is one of the best performances I've seen by a young actor 
uh, in, in the past few years. I mean, it, it is a really dynamite powerhouse performance. And I highly recommend the film uh, to anyone to just see his performance. Um, but if it's not your type of movie, I could see why you, you know, skip it. But if you're a fan of John Cusack, you know, Cusack's good in it too. And if it sounds interesting to you, give it a watch. If, if only just for Paul Dano's performance, some good direction, the uh, fascinating, interesting uh, uh, 60s, uh, seven, early 70s, Beach Boys flashback scenes. Uh, with the Beach Boys while they're working on pet sounds and smile, uh, just to see the how unique and uh, interesting and how much of an individual Brian Wilson was and a lot of ways still is. Uh, so yeah. Anyway, I don't, I don't know what to say about the film Love and Mercy except it's rated out of four stars. I would give it three. Like I said, I'd give it three out of five. Rate out of five actually. Three out of five. It's just okay to me. Like it's a movie I saw for cheap somewhere. Maybe I pick it up just for you know. I've I've heard it has some interesting features. I might be kind of interested in, and maybe it would be better on a second watch. But I just I'm not that interested in the Paul John Cusack stuff. But I really do enjoy the '60s stuff. So, you know, I I, I might pick it up for the collection one day just for that stuff. And uh, so yeah. Anyway, I don't know what else to say except thank you for watching. And as always, I will see you guys later. See ya.